If your crew is setting up a rural hitch at night, proper lighting equipment can be just as vital to safely establishing your water supply. With Command Light, equip crews with a battery-powered Trident tripod or an elevated directional light tower to aid in your nighttime rural hitch operations. Don't leave crews in the dark. Spec Command Light and all of your mobile lighting equipment needs at commandlight.com. The Fire Store, equipping protectors with passion. Every decision the Fire Store makes as a company is about you, the customer. The Fire Store wouldn't be where it is today without you, and the company doesn't take that lightly. It understands that having the right gear can mean the difference between life and death. The Fire Store's goal is to get you the gear you need, when you need it, at prices you can afford. Visit thefirestore.com for everything but the truck, and shop a family of brands that include Streamlight, MSA, Lion, Fleer, and more. Hi, Chris McClune here with Fire Apparatus and Emergency Equipment. Welcome to this, the second episode in our series of water delivery podcasts. Again, uh, with me today is Bill Adkins and also Andy Sacadato. I'm going to ask them to uh, introduce themselves in just a second. But what we're here to talk about today is called the Rural Hitch. Now, some of you who have followed uh, Fire Apparatus and Emergency Equipment know of an article that Bill authored a, a few years ago for us, specifically on the rural hitch. And we're gonna take a little bit more of a deeper dive into that today. Uh, the rural hitch, although it has a it has rural in the uh, title, uh, in, the, in the name, uh, can be used in some other areas as well. So don't get too hung up on the, on the word rural there. This is, a, uh, this is a water supply option that can work in, in many different places, not just our more rural areas. So Bill, since, uh, since, you're, the, uh, since you're the author of that article, I'll throw it over to you first to, uh, to introduce yourself. And then Andy, uh, if you would be so kind after that. Um, and uh, then we'll get into it. Uh, um, Bill Atkins, of course, from, uh, I live in Fayetteville, Ohio. I've been a volunteer there for 29 years. Uh, I also work full time at Loveland Sims Fire Department as a, you know, uh, as a full time battalion captain. And I, uh, I also teach rural water movement operations at FDIC and other other places around you know, the area. Andy. Uh, Andy Sacadato. Uh, I work full time for the state of Tennessee at the State Fire Academy teaching uh, pump and aerial operations. Um, I worked for the city of Charlottesville, Virginia for nine years prior to that uh, as a driver operator. Um, and I also own my own business, the Water Thieves, uh, where we go and teach all kinds of pump and aerial related classes. And we love moving water. So thank you for having us. Before they, oh, no problem at all. Thank you for joining me. Before uh, we get rolling here, if if you do have questions at the end of this that maybe we weren't that we didn't touch on, uh, don't hesitate to contact me at chris.mcloon at clarionevents.com. Let me know what the questions are. I'll get them out to Andy and Bill. And, uh, and, and we'll get those answered for you as soon as possible. Bill, I want to start with you. Um, and could you just go through what the rural hitch is? You know, the, you know, I've already talked about how, you know, it's got rural in the title. And then you think about hitch, you're, you're, a lot of times you're thinking about ropes and not. So talk a little bit about what it, it is specifically. Uh, yeah, it usually starts off with the first due apparatus uh, in a non hydrated area uh, where water supply is minimal. Uh, and we are going, they're going to use different pieces of apparatus as they show up to supply water to that first due apparatus. So it's basically like a water shuttle. Um, sometimes that those are tankers that have tankers or tenders with pumps and they're going to push that water. And then they're going to continue to do that until an engine arrives and can set up some type of water supply using the dump tanks. Um, after the dump tank's set up, it's going to be just like your normal water shuttle. You'll, you know, the tankers would just go back, uh, fill up, and then come back and, and dump their water just like they, we usually do on those uh, rural water supplies. So um, is this more to save time in terms of establishing that water supply and getting it done as quickly as possible? Um, or is this a, a whole other tactic unto itself for water supply? 
Yes, this this gets the fastest water to that first dew apparatus. That a lot of times when that second dew apparatus shows up, they're either running out of water or or already have ran out of water. Instead of that second dew apparatus getting the dump tank out and setting it up and dumping, and then uh, that apparatus drafting, the quickest way to get them water right away for their crews is to go ahead and push that water to them using a relay pump. All right, now, before we get into the ins and outs of how to set it up, the different components necessary to get one up and running, Andy, would you, although there are never absolutes in the fire service, could you, could you go through some scenarios where a rural hitch, you know, would be used or even should be used? Absolutely. So I, uh, just like Bill said, um, you know, the rural hitch is a great tool to utilize in any setting where you are limited on water and have to haul water in from a distant source. Um, I like to think of it as a tactic that allows us to bridge the gap between a simple supply operation to a more complex supply operation. And it, it really revolves around the use of one simple piece of equipment that most of us learn about in our Firefighter One training, and that is a clappered Siamese. Um, and what it allows us to do, like I said, is go from simple to complex. So when we really break down uh, supply operations in any setting, whether it be rural, rural or, or urban, right, in the rural setting especially, there's really two ways to get water to the fire scene. I can either do a direct pumping operation, sometimes called a nursing operation, or I can do dump tank operations, right? And in my experience, what I see a lot of people uh, gravitate towards is a direct pumping operation because the attack engine simply has to lay a supply line up the driveway, uh, later arriving either pumper or tanker tender with a pump can hook into that line and relay pump their water to the attack engine. And that's really simple. That's fast. It's efficient, but it limits me on my ability to flow larger volumes of water or sustain the volume at the fire scene. So then we get into the dump tank operations. And, you know, there's a couple reasons uh, that fire departments don't like to use dump tanks. Me personally, I think the biggest reason is Guys just don't like to put the tanks on the ground and pick them up. But folks that try and go from zero to dump tank end up, like Bill said, running out of water in the meantime as they're waiting for something to come and refill that tank or whatever. Uh, you know, they have an interruption in the prime or whatever may happen. So what this rural hitch allows us to do is it allows us to start really, really simple by performing a direct pumping operation on one side of that Siamese. And then when people, equipment, manpower, everything gets there, we can build ourselves up to a dump tank operation simultaneously while we're still pumping water off the initial supply piece. So um, as far as your question with regards to where do we use this, I really, uh, in, my, in my mind and my experience in the fire departments that I operated with that were in rural settings, this was kind of our go-to play, right? Our go-to play was either the initial attack engine laying up a narrow driveway is going to lay a supply line and leave the clapper Siamese there. Or if that initial engine, for whatever reason, doesn't lay in, the second engine or third engine or whatever, an engine is going to commit down that driveway where we don't really want to have a uh, big mobile water supply apparatus trying to negotiate and get in and then figure out how to get out, right? Well, we want to keep them on the main road where they can offload and bounce, right? So wherever that deployment point is, that's where uh, we set up the hitch. And, you know, uh, from the departments that I go around and see, they're tends to be a lot of discussion on whether it should be the first engine or the second engine or the third engine. In my mind, right, that is, that's going to vary between department because certain agencies, right, you may only get one engine, so you have to lay it when you go in. But the uh, organization that I volunteered with in Albemarle County, Virginia, right, we had five engines and three tankers coming on any rural fire scene. So, we could sacrifice sending up that first initial attack engine without laying a line 
because the second dew pumper would be there within a couple minutes and could lay the supply line if we needed it. Okay, now, Bill, um, Andy mentioned the, the Siamese clapper valve. Uh, I wanted to get into uh, the components that, you know, a department would need to have to assemble, you know, the Royal Hitch and, and get it in service. Is it just that Siamese valve? Are we talking, can, can we do it with other uh, types of appliances, maybe Ys and, and things like that? Yes, uh, um, the, the clapper valve is the, the number one uh, best uh, where we don't have to have an extra person in that line to operate those Ys. I would like to share my screen here and uh, show you a few different variances. And I'm gonna end with that clapper valve that Andy's talking about, because if you're, if you're looking to do this, this as, a, uh, as an operation for your department, it's, it would, it's highly recommend you invest the money to go ahead and get one of these clapper valves for the, uh, the type of supply that you use. I'm gonna work on sharing my screen here. And are you able to see all that? Now we can. Yep. Okay. So what you're seeing here is basically the operation that you would see at the street. And there is that appliance. And then we'll talk about the different ones. But, but uh, while this uh, first apparatus here is uh, they're, they're pumping their water. And when they're empty, they're going to you know, move on. That could be a tanker. It could be an engine. And while, while that's going on, this one here continues to push water without interruption for when this first do apparatus leaves, you know, the second apparatus, let's say, leaves. Um, so we can use multiple apparatus to supply that uh, fire, uh, fire scene. And so here's a, one of the appliances that you can use. However, it's going to take a person at that scene or at this appliance operating these valves. If you, you know, and the blue line represents what's going to the fire scene. And, uh, you know, this, this appliance here, if you use uh, three inch or two and a half inch supply, you can use this, this Y and you can, be, you can do two at a time for more flow. Or if you use five inch supply, you can just put one five inch in and you just keep this valve open. But keep in mind, if you use this five inch on this, when the second do apparatus comes in, they're not going to be able to hook in like you would uh, on, a, on this Siamese that we're about to show you. Uh, the other one here, this is a clapper valve for if you if you use uh, five inch, like let's say the first do apparatus uses five inch, but you know all your mutual aid companies uses three inch or two and a half inch hose. This clapper valve here will, will uh, be a good choice for all those departments to be able to supply uh, to that fire scene. And then this, this is the, uh, this is the, the one, the clapper valve that we're talking about here. Um, and it doesn't matter the brand. Um, you know, we could talk about brands all day, but this clapper valve, uh, the one, uh, the single goes to the fire scene and these two goes back and forth to each one of those apparatus, like we showed earlier in this picture here. And the, these, uh, apparatus keeps supplying that water until they get that dump tank if needed. If it's a room and content fire, you may not need to even put a dump tank down. But these things, these uh, apparatus are uh, going to be supplying the fire scene until that operation that needs to happen takes, takes place. You know, and as you were talking uh, about that, it, it occurs to me really, you know, uh, the 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 Siamese clapper is valve is really going to be your safest bet as well because you're not going to have a firefighter there. You're not only going to depend on the firefighter turning the right valve to to supply, but you're also uh, not putting a firefighter there if the line were to blow off or, or or something like that. So there's also a safety component to this as well. Sure is. Yeah, absolutely. Now, Andy, uh, what types of pressures are we looking at? I mean, you know, sometimes sometimes you can overthink it, you know. So, I mean, I'm not expecting that there are, you know, like all kinds of different variations here. Um, you know, it might just be that um, we pump at the same, you know, the same kind of pressures that we would for any other, you know, supply line. And, you know, of course, the the limitations of the hose are going to uh, are going to um, 
uh, are going to dictate that as well. But and, and you're in relatively close proximity just based on those pictures that we already saw. Um, and, you know, just kind of the idea that, that we have from from the initial description that, that we had of, of when you place this in service. But what kind of pressures are we looking at there? Are there are there are there uh, limits and do you have any cautionary uh, comments to make about about pressures and such? Absolutely. So I think the real the the real thing that fire departments need to understand and look at is they need to know what kind of supply line that they're dealing with. Right. And in, in the rural environment, at least from what I come across, I really see fire departments using three types of uh, diameters of supply line, either three inch, four inch or five inch, depending on how their department is made up. So, you know, doing a quick little scenario. Uh, drawn out, let's say that we have an 800 foot driveway, which could be really long in some areas or not long at all in other areas, depending on where you are in the, in the country. So if I had um, 800 foot of three inch on the ground and I want to use the rural hitch, right? The next question to really come into play is, well, how much water am I going to expect? And you know, obviously the flow rate is going to have a huge impact on friction loss and everything in the supply line. But what we really need to look back and, and understand um, is what can we realistically supply on a rural fire ground with, you know, average staffing, stuff like that. And in the classes that I teach, I tell people that they should be really, really, really proud of themselves if they can consistently maintain 500 gallons a minute. Because typically, depending on how far your fill site is from your uh, uh, fire scene and how many tankers or tenders you have in the route, right, 500 gallons a minute, that could be really, really difficult to maintain, right? Ideally, you should set yourself up for at least 300 gallons a minute in my mind, because then we're meeting NFPA standards for 300 gallon per minute between the first two hand lines. But for me, right, 500 is my goal because I could put a heavy caliber stream in service if I needed to. So assuming that we're trying to flow 500 gallons a minute up this driveway and we're using a single three inch line that's 800 foot long, you're looking at a pump discharge pressure around 180 to 210 pounds. And that is about 160 pounds worth of friction loss plus between 20 to 50 pounds of intake pressure on the attack engine's intake. So if I switch to four inch hose, I can drastically reduce that pump pressure to about 90 pounds flat, right? So that takes into account my friction loss plus 50 pounds for intake pressure. And if I go to five inch hose in the same example, you're looking at about roughly 70 pounds of pump discharge pressure to feed that operation. So a lot of people will look at this and say, well, that's that's an argument to go for five inch hose in the rural environment and using this uh, clappered siamis. I tell people to to think about that decision very, very carefully, because here's the major disadvantage of large diameter hose with use in the rural environment and the rural hitch. The larger the diameter of the hose, the more water it takes to charge it. So while my five inch hose has lower pump pressures and I can pump almost just a little bit above idle, it's going to take in that 800 foot lay, it's going to take 800 gallons of water to just fill the supply line. So if I'm dealing with maybe an engine that's only carrying 750 gallons of water on board or maybe a thousand, I'll barely fill the line right? I'll barely fill the line. Whereas if I go to four inch, that's only about 65 gallons uh, per hundred foot and three inches, even less than that. So the advantage to the smaller line is I get more water to the fire scene to fight the fire, right? Mm -hmm. However, if I need to flow more volume, right? If I'm using three inch, that could become problematic. So one thing that I, uh, you know, kind of backing up, about the Clapper Siamese that I think is really important for folks to look at when you are either evaluating the Siamese that you have in your fire department, or if you're listening and saying, you know what, we should probably look at employing this tactic. If you're going to purchase a new Siamese, make sure it has a double clapper, meaning there's clappers on both sides, because that way, if for whatever reason, both hoses or no pumper is pumping to it, once you fill that supply line, water will not come back out. A lot of departments that I go to try and do a variation of the rural hitch without a Siamese or a Y or anything, 
And then what ends up happening is when they break the supply line to give it to another rig that's pumping to the attack engine, all that water that they used to charge the line initially drains out. So you have to repay that debt every time you're going to supply them. Whereas the clappered Siamese, especially one with a double clapper, ensures that you pay that debt one time, right? It's one, you pay it once and then everything else is, is gain from there on. Um, and then, you know, one other thing with the three inch hose, um, ideally, I like to tell folks that if you're using three inch hose in the rural setting, Ideally, hopefully you're setting your rigs up to have a split load bed, uh, you know, two beds, a three inch, and that you're laying dual threes up the driveway initially. And what I really like about that is, one, I can still do the roll hitch. Two, it allows me to get more of my volume uh, to the fire scene without wasting it filling hose. But three, right, the advantage here is that it, um, it, it is, is really simple if you deploy it correctly. So what I tell folks in the rural setting to do is take your three inch, keep your Siamese connected to one of those beds. When you lay out, you're gonna lay the bed with the clappered Siamese, and then the other bed is just gonna be that three inch just right on the ground. Your incoming companies just need to know, hey, initially we hook to the Siamese, we charge that first line, right? I don't even worry about that second line, one, unless I have the volume to support it, or two, the fire requires that volume, right? I may not even have to charge the second line. If I do, hydraulically speaking, when I back in or keep my dump site pumper out on the street, however you set up your dump site, and I transition from a direct pumping operation to a dumping operation, if I need to give more volume up the, up the hill or down the driveway, all that dump site pumper does is take that second line, hook it to a discharge, charge it, and now I'm feeding the fire scene with parallel supply lines, right? And hydraulically speaking, when I put two three-inch lines down a driveway going to the same fire scene, going to the same intake of the attack pumper, hydraulically speaking, that's the same as a single four-inch line. So the friction loss in both of those lines, when I split the flow between the two, is the same as it would be if I had one four inch line going up that driveway. So I essentially am carrying four inch hose on my rig that has a split bed of three inch in the rural setting and I can get larger flows if I need it. Thinking about complexity, when, when you mentioned that 500 gallons a minute uh, continuous, uh, you know, that to it sounded like this would probably be a more appropriate um, <clears throat> application for for fires that are not involving master streams is that accurate or can this also be set up because it sounds like you know establish, establishing the supply itself is probably not too complex but when you get into the continuous flows maybe that's when it becomes uh, harder and i guess by that time you would likely be transitioning over to the to the dump tanks correct 100 percent, right 100 percent. the the intention and really, right, the other reason I like to think of 500 gallons a minute in my head is because if we look at the NFPA 1901 or 1900 standard now, right, we know that uh, a, a pumper or a tanker that has uh, a 500 gallon or a larger tank, the tank to pump plumbing only has to be capable of flowing 500 gallons a minute from the tank to the pump. So, um, you know, whether I'm doing defensive uh, firefighting at the scene or maybe it's just one hand line going interior, my mind from the supply aspect, I know that I can't deliver more than 500 gallons a minute up there, even off my tank, even if the attack engine wants it, right? But to your point, Chris, right, the big thing to remember is if I'm trying to flow that type of volume consistently and for a long duration, now we're getting into multiple tank operations. We're going to be getting into bridging, jet siphon lines, right? Um, possibly, depending on what else is going on, my dump site pumper might want to be considering a, um, a twin tube drafting configuration to maximize their volume. But again, that isn't necessarily a requirement for the rural hitch. The rural hitch can be advantageous for 
flows as little as, you know, 150 gallons a minute for a single hand line. Uh, Bill, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, the one, one thing I'd like to add to that is uh, that you mentioned the uh, your plumbing from your tank to your pump. Um, that is your weak spot in this, in this system until that dump tank is set up. You can have all the five inch on the ground you want, but if you're just using your tank to pump tank water, your 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 apparatus is usually set up with a three inch you know tank to pump uh, valve, and you're not going to get any more than seven hundred gallons and seven to seven hundred fifty gallons a minute from that tank water. Um, something we do here at Fayetteville is nurse tanker, and because we use the nurse tanker, that tanker never leaves, and it's always going to use its pump water or tank water until it establishes from the dump tank. So we put two four inch tank to pump valves in there so that we get that extra volume using just our tank water. So you can have all the five inch you want, but if during your normal apparatus using your tank water, you can outflow over that 700 to 750 gallons a minute. I, I think that might be an important aspect as well to bring up, or, or maybe not. I might, you know, I, I might be speaking out of turn. But um, what what type of rigs do you want uh, supplying that first do engine? Um, can you do it with just purely water haulers, or should it be more of a pumper tanker setup where even if it's a three thousand gallon tanker that pulls up to to supply um do you want to have a pump on that or or can you do it with just you know like uh water haulers usually in the perfect world we, we'll have we want a tanker there first to, to push as much water to them to that fire scene while an engine or you know a smaller apparatus sets up that you know the, they're going to stay there on the scene we in the rural hitch uh, world, we don't want the tanker sitting on the, on the fire ground. We want them shoveling water. So as soon as that, at that actual engine shows up with the smaller tank, we can actually have them stay there and set up the, the long haul. Okay. Okay. What, um, Bill, I want to stay with you for this one. Um, we, we've talked a lot about the rural side of this. I mentioned in the beginning that it can be used in other, in other places. Um, you know, in a suburban environment, um, obviously the example that's already been used, a long driveway uh, is, is an example, but can you think of any other examples where um, some of our, our, our suburban firefighters, maybe not, on the, maybe not on the city side, but maybe suburban firefighters now um, would use this. Um, there are places, uh, just the one township over from me, it's got a hydranted area where they, you know, they have a real good supply of water. But then on the other end of the, of the township, they get into a spot where there are no, there are no hydrants or, or very few hydrants. So the water is, is, is not as great. So that's probably one example where something like this could be used. But uh, uh, could you give me some other suburban examples? Uh, yeah, we have uh, some suburbans in, uh, suburban area in, in Loveland with long driveways, you know, it could be 2000 feet driveway and we can set up uh, some type of rural hitch using that. An another one is the highways. How often do you see hydrants on highways? Uh, there are some states out there that, that do have some hydrants on there, but that's very far and few in between. So um, using, if when we have a, a highway type of run, we'll, we can set up a, a rural hitch using that. Um, I'm, I'm not in a, I'm not an advocate of the first due apparatus drafting. You know, if something was to happen to that apparatus, we, we're done with water. So setting up the rural hitch for those next due tankers coming in to uh, set up a dump site works works better, even, even in a suburban community. Now, guys, we, we've talked about an awful lot of applications for this. We've talked about some some tactical areas where we can get into this, but not, none of this is going to occur on the fire ground with any level of fluidity or efficiency if we don't train on it. Um, so could, could you guys uh, just jump right in, whoever wants to on this one, could you talk about the training necessary? This is not, it, it's not a crazy labor intensive operation as, as I understand it. But that being said, you know, like anything else, two o'clock in the morning, you can really, you can really get fouled up. So, you know, what, what are some of the training considerations for this? A big thing with me is training with mutual aid, because as we've talked, there's a lot of apparatus coming, unless you 
are on a department that has multiple stations and where your department itself can sustain all of this by themselves, which isn't very common in the, in the rural setting. Uh, you got to train with your mutual aid companies. They got to understand what they need to do when they show up to this end of this driveway and they see this clapper valve with a section of hose there. What do they need to do? Uh, and if you don't train with them, they're going to look at, they're going to walk up the driveway and ask you what you need, <laughs> you know? So it, we got to include our mutual aid partners. And communication, I'm sorry, I know probably Andy, you were getting ready to jump in, but this all really does come back to communicating, you know, so that they're not walking up the driveway, you know, asking, asking what you need. So not only is it, you know, not only is it, you know, making sure they know, you know, what you mean when you do ask for it, it's, it's communicating that on the way in, you know, like you're, you guys, you guys are setting up the, the rural hitch, you know, uh, next due or, or what have you. Yeah. I'm yeah. Gonna... I think, I think, I think the big thing that I see, especially with the training that should go along with it is discipline as well. Right. Um, and a lot of, a lot of people, the cool thing about the rural hitch is that that term, depending on where you are in the United States, can mean a couple different things, right? Um, you know, like Bill was saying, one variant of it is to do that nurse tender operation where, you know, the first tender pulls up, hooks up, pumps, and then the second one comes and hooks to the other side. And then we kind of do this leapfrog. And that works for small fires, but if I need to transition to something bigger, I really want to be thinking about putting that dump tank down and instead having that engine hook on that other side and, you know, transfer over. So the organizations that I worked for and volunteered with, you know, our policy and the discipline that we had was whether it was, you know, a small outside fire that we laid supply line up the driveway to attack or it was a full barn burner. Our policy was that the first arriving supply piece, whether that be in an engine or a tanker, typically a tanker, they were going to hook and nurse to the attack engine. But when the first engine or the next arriving engine arrived, they were going to position, set a dump tank up, hook to the other side, no matter what. So that way we could either continue to nurse if it's tiny or we are ready 100% to dump into the dump tank draft and then sustain a larger volume more efficiently and not keep tankers on the, on the uh, scene, just sitting there offloading very, very slowly using their uh, pump. So it really depends for us. It worked very well because we had the discipline to know that no matter what the dump tank was going to be in the street. The only question was whether or not water was going to be in the tank or not. And if it ends up being a small fire, right? It's really easy to fold that tank up and put it on one of the, the tankers and bounce, right? Um, but if we need it, it's there and we can very seamlessly transition from simple to complex. And um, I think that's the big thing to really hammer home is it is not an excuse to not put dump tanks on the ground. It is a better option to bridge, you know, getting fast water to the fire scene and then transitioning to larger volumes that are sustained and I have a good, efficient mobile water supply operation. A lot of times we think of having a water supply officer for a major event, you know, like a warehouse burning to the ground or, or something like that. Is this a situation when you're putting one of these in service? Again, as simple as it is, uh, do you want to have a water supply officer uh, watching over that and uh, coordinating that? Or, uh, you know, even for your smaller fires, where, fires where, you know, you go up that driveway, but it turns out it's just a, just a room and contents that you maybe maybe it'll be like a two tank fire or, uh, you know, can can these occur smoothly, I guess, without designating someone to oversee the operation? With, with training, they can, you know, with training uh, and d the discipline, like Andy mentioned, uh, it, it don't necessarily have to have a. a uh, water supply officer. However, on those larger instances, I highly recommend having some type of water supply officer, making sure that the tankers are going to the right filling sites and, and setting up. If 
if need be, multiple filling sites. And it's not something, you know, so that's that. We want to take that burden off of the incident commander to have to relay that information back to them when you can have a uh, water supply officer at the end of the driveway or whatever it may be, uh, telling these firefighters where to go and what to do. Would it make sense to have two? I, I'm just asking because, I mean, you know, this isn't something that I've ever placed in service before, but I've certainly been on on fires where we've had a water supply officer. But does does for something like this, because this is almost um, – for, for, for a larger one where you would need to, to put in, you know, to, to drop the tanks. Um, is something where you, maybe you have one person, um, and this gets into like rural operations, which I, I you know, do not claim any kind of expertise in, uh, but would it make sense to have someone on, you know, handling the, the, uh, the, over, the, the, the tank part of this and then somebody just overseeing the rural hitch until the other supply is established and then they can, they can participate in the, in the larger operation? So, so typically what, um, what I like to uh, get in the habit of doing is whether you assign a, a water supply officer from the, the beginning or not, all pump operators should understand if they're pulling up and they're going to be that dump side engine, right? They're setting up to be the dump side engine. They are going to automatically assume that role of the water supply officer initially. Right. So so another thing, another step about that discipline is making sure that everybody in your organization knows that, yeah, the operator of the dump site pumper is the water supply officer initially. So he's calling the shots as far as how this is how this is transpiring, because right once he gets in the driveway or stays out in the street, hooks to the Siamese and is ready to transition from the draft. The guy who's driving that uh, tanker who may be initially supplying water to the scene, he's going to leave. He or she's going to leave as soon as they're empty and they're going to fall into the shuttle route. So that dump site operator, he is there until somebody else can assume that true water supply officer role. And, um, you know, Chris, to your point on these larger incidents, absolutely. It's probably beneficial to have, you know, a supervisor overseeing the the pumping portion and then an actual uh, water supply officer overseeing that entire dump site. And this is when we're getting into multiple dump site pumpers, multiple transfer engines and, and all that. But on your basic, you know, residential fire in the rural setting where you may have no more than two dump tanks, maybe one jet siphon between them, one pump operator operating and tankers just offloading. If you don't have the staffing to dedicate a water supply officer, ideally textbook says you should, but if you don't, that dump side uh, engine operator should understand that that falls on him or her, right? That That's who it's going to fall on. And possibly ask for another fire ground for that so that you're not tying up the radio traffic, talking about where tankers are going to, fill and things like that and tying up that radio traffic where the crews inside may, may need that, that airtime. Well, that, yeah, that's sometimes a challenge in itself. I'll tell you what, <laughs> I've listened to plenty of calls where water supplies were moved over to another channel and you still have people calling, you know, the, yeah. the main, the main command one. So that to talk that's about true. discipline and, you know, uh, you know, knowing, knowing your radios and, you know, it's almost, almost the discipline of listening, you know, to make sure that, uh, that everybody that everybody's there. Um, so we, we've talked about a lot of different components to this today. Again, a, a relatively simple process, but one that can, you know, that one one that can be done um, wrong. Uh, but uh, do you uh, I'll start with you, Bill. Do you have any general comments or any any takeaways that you would like listeners or viewers today to, to take away with them to, to bring back to their own departments? Well, uh, big uh, big thing is uh, Andy and my, myself discussed this earlier uh, before we started this podcast. There are many different uh, variances of this. The things we talked about in this podcast, you know, it just touches the small little bit of the options that you can do. I've, I've known, uh, I've seen rural hitch users uh, that tanker shows up on the scene, and and the other apparatus just keeps the tank full on that, for that, that second do apparatus that's pushing water. So there's just a lot of different variances. Um, it all, and it all depends on what resources you have around you. Not everybody has the resources to, you know, be able to uh, supply water to the first do apparatus via a pump. 
if you're if you have a lot of tankers in your area that doesn't have a pump, this this air is not going to work for you. You know, until that next new engine shows up. So just a lot of variances and, and train on it. Okay. Andy, how about you? Yeah, the biggest thing is, right, get out, like Bill said, get out and train with it. Um, you know, if, if folks haven't picked up on this theme yet over, you know, these uh, the last two podcasts, this topic and, you know, really any water supply topic typically isn't the, you know, sexiest thing that people want to talk about or go out and do. And let's be real, water supply involves a lot of work and, and that's what it is. So, you know, it it behooves you as an organization, as a fire department, uh, as a company to just get out. And I'm not saying you have to do, you know, a thousand gallon per minute water shuttle, but even just putting some hose on the ground to simulate an engine that laid up a driveway and going over, where do you hook? And hey, if I'm coming in with the tanker from this direction, where should I pull past or stop short of the driveway to leave room for this dump site to be built out, right? How can I be thinking 10 steps ahead to make sure everything operates seamlessly? Um, this is one tool for the toolbox and it is no good if you don't train on it and use it. So get out there and train. All right, great. Well, my thanks to both of you again for joining me today. We have a number, as I mentioned, this is, this is only the second uh, episode uh, covering water delivery, but we do have a number of, of episodes in the works. Uh, a couple of upcoming ones, we're going to be talking about uh, intake valve selection and, and some tips on how to, how to do that properly and make sure that uh, you're set up to, to, move, to move as much water as possible. And also, we're going to get into some cold weather uh, water delivery operations uh, so that we can touch on that as we, as we get into the winter, especially, you know, the, um, not, not only for us on the mid Atlantic and the East Coast here, but, you know, there's an awful lot of, awful lot of, uh, uh Midwest, Midwest areas that see some snow and see some ice. And, uh, so we're going to get into that as well. Again, my thanks to Bill and Andy for joining me today. If you have any questions on the rural hitch, uh, please don't hesitate to let me know. I can either, uh, we'll, we'll either, I'll either get them back to you, uh, from Bill and Andy via email, or, you know, as, as we continue with these podcasts, we'll, we'll, we'll cover some, uh, some of the questions that, that may have been touched on on the pre, on a previous one, uh, as, as we get rolling on the next one. So please let me know, chris.mcloon, M-C-L-O-O-N-E at clarionevents.com. Also be sure we've now got, this is, uh, I'm not sure which episode this is. This is eight or nine, uh, but we've got a few. Uh, we've got a few under our belts here at this point. So if you go to fireapparatusmagazine.com/podcasts, uh, you can see uh, the archive of all the podcasts that we've done. So again, this has been Chris McClune with Andy Sacadato and Bill Adkins. Have a good one and stay safe. Thanks again, guys. <laughs>